listening to After Images, a podcast for cinephiles that takes a deep dive into moving images. Each episode features a special guest who is invited to explore a film of their choice. After Images is hosted by film writers Franck Bouleg and Marisa C. Hayes. Our eighth episode explores Nicholas Rogue's 1973 film Don't Look Now in the company of author and screenwriter Stephen Volk. The film is an adaptation of Daphne du Maurier's short story of the same title and stars Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie as a married couple attempting to work through the traumatic loss of their daughter who drowned in a pond at their home in England. The couple travel to Venice, far from the site of the accident, but upon arrival they are haunted by a complex labyrinth of illusions, delusions, and visions which John Baxter, the father, tries to untangle while tracking a mysterious killer. Don't Look Now oscillates between psychological drama, mystery, and horror, drawing on both Western mythology and Italian gialli. Spoiler alert, our guest Stephen Volk made sure to request that we give you fair warning. If you haven't yet seen the film, we'll be discussing plot twists. Come back and give the episode a listen once you've seen the film. Stephen Volk is best known as the award-winning writer of the BBC's controversial Halloween hoax Ghost Watch and the ITV paranormal drama series Afterlife, starring Leslie Sharp and Andrew Lincoln. His other screen plays include The Awakening 2011, starring Rebecca Hall and Ken Russell's Gothic, starring Natasha Richardson and Gabriel Byrne. He is the author of a number of short story collections and has appeared in many best of the year anthologies. His latest books are Under a Raven's Wing and Lies of Tenderness, both available from PS Publishing. You can find more information at stephenvolk.net. Welcome, Stephen Volk. We're delighted today to be discussing Nicholas Rogue's 1973 film, Don't Look Now. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's good to talk about it. I can't think of any film at most more like to talk about so uh, this is a great opportunity excellent and we always like to start the podcast by asking why did you suggest this film what does it mean to you um i guess first of all i think it's kind of a masterpiece which my definition would be uh however many times you see it you see new things in it and however many opportunities you get to watch it again you'll watch it again (laughs) and it's one of those things that if i were in a hotel room and i'm flipping channels and it happens to be on i watch it i watch it all or i watch a part of it and there's always new things to notice and it's it's quite incredible because some of those things not all of those things can be kind of intentional or planned uh, i mean you can't possibly plan every single frame of a film but there's some symbiosis or synchronicity about the making of this film and the way it came together and the way it hits the screen and the way it hits people that see it Um, that I think makes something very special. And the number of directors I've worked with that, uh, if you mention Don't Look Now, because I work in kind of supernatural arena a lot of the time, uh, and I was working with the director the the other day, actually, you know, we were talking about films, I mentioned Don't Look Now, and everyone kind of grabs their heart as if it's, you know, very close to their heart. And it has a most peculiar, um, I wouldn't say nostalgia, nostalgia is a bit of a um, debased word. But I wouldn't say nostalgia, but it has, has a very firm grip of people once they've seen it, really. And I think I think it works on multiple levels. So it, it's very important to me. The, the film was shot in 1973, which means that it is turning 50 this year. Um, it, to On what level is it still relevant for uh, the world we live in? And why do you think that it uh, continuously has this sort of impact on us? Um. To me, I can, I can I can only answer that personally. I think really why it stayed with me is probably the best way to answer that um, because I can't really talk for how it, how it stays with a number of people or how it. If I could guess how it, how films appeal to mass audience, I'd be a millionaire. So I can't do that. But I can say I can say I think why it appeals to me, and and maybe I can then go back and describe my my first viewing of it. Um, 
Uh, to me, it is something uh, of kind of existential depth about it, uh, especially for a quotes commercial film that gets to the nature and and w one always flirts with uh, pretentiousness. So forgive me, but um, um, it 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 kind of is about the nature of what it feels like to be human, and by that I mean that it it is a um, it's a dramatic debate between faith and skepticism. And where do you fall on that gray area between completely believing in the supernatural or God or, or any of that kind of stuff, or completely not believing in that? Now, we're, we all occupy different points on that spectrum, I think. Um, so without actually asking the audience outright, but with a wagging finger, what do you believe? It, it, it explores through the, the prism, if you like, of, of a couple who are, who are very close and loving in, in, in some ways and kind of knotted together because of the drama that they're locked in, but completely polarized opposite in that respect. And I, I and that's really what stays with me, is that kind of moral debate, that kind of human dilemma between the two characters and the journey that they go on. And that's why I think it'll 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 never really go out of fashion because I think it's the eternal uh, human struggle about what do we believe in and what is life worth and is there something more than life or is there is there nothing more than life uh, and to dramatize that through two characters I think is a really wonderful and clever thing both you know obviously from Daphne du Maurier which we can we can get into the difference between the story and the and the screen version but but also you know Nicholas Rogue's uh, unique um, perspective and preoccupations which he's shown in some of his other films. And this is such an exciting period, 1973, for filmmaking. We just mentioned before we began recording what an interesting period the 1970s represented for filmmaking where things seemed crack to crack wide open. Um, and I'm thinking about the fact that Rogue in particular has this very um, open approach. I'm thinking here about the open work, Umberto Eco, who speaks a lot about the open work and the fact that the audience is participating in the reading of the film. And Rogue was such a huge proponent of that. So on one hand, we have the structure that you just mentioned in terms of this drama about the family and the human pathos that we find in the film. And at the same time, do you think perhaps that some of the film's power comes from this open sense the non-linear aspect of the film I definitely i think i think when you think of a again we can open up the, uh, this into more conversation but when you think of a genre film say a ghost story um there are forms and formulae and uh, uh aspects whereby you expect a scene to go in a certain way you expect oh this is the scene where someone's frightened this is the scene where something jumps out this is the scene where they discover this this is the scene where the person gets a bit more information from the expert this is the you know and so on and so forth so to actually tell a genre story in a way that's kind of non-genre that is one of the things that really creates the dramatic tension in in the whole thing really uh, in the way, in a way, Friedkin did it with The Exorcist, in a sense, which was uh, not really, not not absolutely, but it's almost like my artistic um, uh, take on this is to kind of do it as if it really happened and as if it's a documentary. I'm not saying you'd look at it now and think it's a documentary, but to compare with other things in the genre at the time, uh, it did stand out as being having naturalistic acting. Uh, you know, real locations and 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 that kind of thing. Um, we're, we're, that's probably not a super good example because there are uh, schlock holler moments and constructed um, scenes in the way that uh, B movies have it in that film. But but I'm saying a lot, a lot of what Friedkin did is, is it can be corresponded to what uh, Nick Rogue did. Um, and I, and I think what he did also was exactly what you said is which which he does things that are interesting but he leaves them as questions he doesn't throw them in and say this is going to pay off like a plot point or a, a prop that you're going to see later that's going to be meaningful to the clue to the detective story to the whatever um i mean the perfect example is the detective doesn't solve anything the detective is in it he never comes up with anything he's there as a character and he's a really interesting character but he doesn't actually catch anyone you know that's that's really subversive for a star 
Uh, and another small example, for instance, is the, um, which I love this moment, um, where the bishop wakes up in the middle of the scene. He kind of has had a nightmare and he just kind of wakes up and I think he then goes back to sleep. It, it absolutely means nothing. But hmm. does it mean something? Does it mean that we're all on some level interconnected as human beings? Hmm. Because he's a spiritual person, is he attuned to something that he doesn't understand? Or is he a person that, in spite of all his religious protections, is nevertheless disturbed by the morality around him? <laughs> and, and none of this is told, but that one shot and that one bit of editing, you could write a whole uh, essay about, you know, and that's that's one of the things I love about this whole thing, really. Mm. But, uh, but can I can I just tell you my experience of when I first saw it in 1970? Oh, yeah. this, this is so important to, for you understanding where I come from on this. I was um, studying film at the time in um, Lanchester University. I was studying graphic design and I was specializing in film, uh, making animation films of all things. So I had no idea what my future was. I thought I'd probably be a book illustrator or something like that. Um, and uh, we would often go and see films in the afternoon. Um, and uh, I can picture the, cine the cinema now because it was literally a few hundred yards from where the art college was. And one wet Wednesday afternoon in Coventry, and Coventry is the most boring place in the world, uh, <laughs> just so you understand in France. But uh, uh, actually, it's not the most boring place in the world. It's it's kind of has a reputation for, for being uh, uh, not very exciting. But anyway, the double bill was The Wicker Man and Don't Look Now. They were, I don't know if you know, but they were released mm. at the same time as a double mm. bill, basically because the distributor didn't think either film was very good, which is <laughs> ludicrous when you think back on it, because both films are absolute classics now. So I sat through uh, the, Wicker, the Wicker Man, and that was that was pretty damn, damn good, with its shock ending. Um, and then I watched Don't Look Now. I think I was the only person in the cinema, so that, that <laughs> added to the effect. But I'm not kidding. When it got to the very end of Don't Look Now, I was so um, perplexed by the way the plot turned at mm. the end that I literally thought I'd gone mad. I thought I'm having a heart attack here. My brain, have they put a different reel on at the end of the film? Because mm. I did, when that character at the end turns around and faces Donald Sutherland, mm. I thought that's that should be his daughter. What's going on here? Mm -hmm. um, and I just did not understand. It was the most perplexed I've ever been by anything, uh, any work of art in my life. And then, of course, you have the, with expert timing, you have that montage mm -hmm. that goes over the rest of the film and tells you all the clues that have been given to you about mm -hmm. what's actually going on, that he's been, that he has been uh, uh, blind to the uh, his own prediction of his own death. Mm -hmm. I, I think that sums it up, for me anyway. Um, <laughs> And he realizes uh, as he um, as the life ebbs out of him that he's been told the truth all along and he hasn't been able to add it up. And in his last few breaths of life, he realizes everything has been going on and it's too late. Hmm. And <laughs> that to me is such a, uh, it then goes beyond, I think, a mystery and a thriller and a, and a ghost story, or but technically. Um, hmm and becomes something of a kind of absurdist mm. kind of comment on humanity that 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 we're chasing we're chasing something we're chasing something we think is something and we get to the end of life we think we know what's going on but it's by the time you figure out what life is all about that's it yeah. tough luck it's gone and it became it became became such a profound moment that the more i thought about it Hmm. about the absurdity of life you know and and so bold and scary and um horrific but hmm. also kind of absurdist um hmm. and of course the the last line of the Daphne du Maurier book I think is him thinking uh what a bloody stupid way to die I think is the last line exactly. uh, which of course <laughs> you, you don't put that line in the film but but the essence of it is in hmm. in the film you know um so so I just, I, you know, that, you know, the idea that at the end of life all would become clear and we spend our life being confused about what what we're here for and what we're, mm -hmm. what we're doing it for. And it's a kind of detective story that we never come to the, you know, I just love that whole shape of it, really. Um, mm -hmm. And that, you know, and but the form of it as well stayed with me in, in and kind of infected, if you like, or, or 
um, resonated in, in my writing because I kept kept coming back to the ideas that were in it, I think. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's almost as if uh, one could script uh, one's own life. I mean, as if you could mm, create meaning out of your own life. Um, yeah. um, but uh, just before we started recording, we were talking about uh, Hollywood and cinema and about um, how much it is predictable. Um, and definitely, this is definitely not the case with Don't Look Now, um, uh, that can't be um, reduced to a genre. And that keeps us guessing all along. We never know what's going to happen. He never knows what's going to happen, but the audience doesn't yep. know either. And I think that this uh, sort of uh, parallel between the two is very interesting and powerful. It's quite like, uh, it, in a sense, it's a little bit like Vertigo. I love the description of Vertigo, which is um, uh, which is a bit like Oedipus Rex, in that it's a detective story in which the mystery turns out to be the detective is the mm -hmm. mystery. You know, and I think it's the same with the with the Donald Sutherland character in Don't Look Now. The mystery is him, really. And mm. if he he's but he's blind to his true nature. That's what's tragic about it. Mm. And he's dismissive of her instinct. Mm. So it's a battle between rationality and instinct. That's why it's so fundamental to human nature, I think, really, because I think, you know, with the sp split brain, the two hemispheres, the left brain, right brain, uh, you know, it it. For all of us, it's a battle between rationality and, and belief. Some people give in to belief and maybe it's a, maybe it's a comfort or maybe it's a maybe it's a, a delusion. Who know who knows? You can interpret it lots of ways. And that's that's also why I like that he thinks it's a delusion on her part, but then he knows it's a comfort, but it is also a delusion and she can't see why he he doesn't see it her way, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you get the little moments little moments which I absolutely love where he's in the darkened church and the, there's the light the light switch and he just switches on and off the light switch mm -hmm. uh, you know like it, you know we've got all this technology to light the darkness but do we still live in darkness really mm -hmm. you know and there's still the the old woman there lighting candles mm -hmm. even though there's a there's a light perfectly good light switch you mm -hmm. know and none of it is made anything of uh, in dialogue or anything like that but it's all part of the landscape of the film which I love you know and the film was so striking for you as a young film student would you say that it was responsible in part for your shift towards writing um I think I was right I was writing but I think it, it I think it gradually dawned on me that this juxtaposition of someone that believes and someone that's skeptical was was a really good kind of engine for the kind of stories that I liked um I'll tell you a little story about when I was um, I was trying to pitch. Um, uh, I did a TV story, a series called Afterlife, which is about a psychic and a psychologist, um, with uh, uh, Leslie Sharp and Andrew Lincoln star starred in it. Um, but in the nineties, when I was pitching it, um, it was slightly before um, The Sixth Sense came out. And it's basically the same idea as the six sets, someone that can see dead people. But anyway, the TV company here um, said they wanted to do something about a ghost series. So my agent got me in to pitch to them. And I, and I said, well, uh, I've always thought that a kind of consulting medium would be a good format for a TV show because you rather like Sherlock Holmes, you can have stories of the week, as they call it, you know, or case of the week. You can have people people come with a story and you have resolve it and you you have another story the following week. And they said, well, we're thinking like the X-Files. So if she is one character, what would the other character be? Would it be a, uh, would it be a cop? And I said, no, it wouldn't be a cop because you, then you've just got mystery that has to be solved by a detective and, you know, uh, Ghost stories never work out as ghost stories if they if they kind of <laughs> become a kind of mystery. They become like Scooby Doo, and said, "Oh, okay then. So is it a medium and a priest?" And I said, "No, there's no tension in that because you've got two people that believe. They might believe in two different things, but where is the um, you know grit in that?" I said, "No, it's got to be a a medium and a psychologist. So the psychologist brings the rational side." that he thinks she's mad or deluded. She thinks he is blind. Um, so I got that series off the ground. Um, really, really them thinking that I was doing some variation of the X-Files, but, but really it was a variation of John and Laura in Don't Look Now. That's what I had in my mind. That's the two characters I wanted. Um, you know, the believer and, and the skeptic. And I wanted to go on this journey 
um, you know, to, towards the end. And, and the funny thing I just realized when I was thinking about talking to you was at the end of Don't Look Now, it's kind of like he's, Don't Look Now in the story, like I say, he says, what a bloody stupid way to die. Uh, and it's all kind of, he, you know, he kind of resolves, it all becomes kind of clear to him. And I realized that in Afterlife, I did the opposite without realizing it. That I actually had him, uh, the Robert character, the psychologist, dies. Uh, and when, after he dies, he speaks to Alison, the medium, and he, he says, I thought it would be clear. Like he's, he's, he's passed to the other side and he says, I thought it would be clear, but it's not. Mm -hmm. So mm. I did the exact opposite of Don't Look Now, where mm. it becomes clear at the moment of death. Mm. And I kind of pushed it a bit further by not being clear, even when you go to the next place, it's not clear what's going on, you know, mm. which I, I didn't realize I was I was playing with that. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot of the, and I did another, um, another film called The Awakening with Rebecca Hall, and she's a kind of ghost hunter type character. And she's kind of like both characters in Don't Look Now in that she starts off as a skeptic and it ends up, you know, very much like Vertigo, kind of discovering something about herself. So she has to believe, um, you know, what she's experienced kind of thing, really. But um, but no, I think I think the genre thing is really interesting because I think of it like this. The reason I, I, I gravitate to genre is that you basically tell stories in what I think is a more kind of vivid way. So you have the subject... I guess the subject in Don't Look Now is grief. So there's lots of ways to tell a story about grief. Um, there's a, a beautiful film, French film called Under the Sand. I don't know if you remember that. That was a beautiful film about grief. Uh, so you can you can you can tell a realistic film about grief. You don't have to have a supernatural element. You don't have to have the dead talking to you or anything like that. You can just do a film about grief. You can do it in a soap opera <laughs> or, or any conventional drama. But uh, for me personally, I, I think people that are drawn to the genre, um, you can use genre elements to, I think, um, how would I say, amplify or expand on what is a naturalistic story. Mm -hmm. So it becomes, I guess, again, flirting with pretension always, uh, it becomes kind of poetic. Mm -hmm. So the idea of, let's say, in, in Afterlife, where, that, where I have a... a a skeptical guy dying talking to uh the woman that that uh, that he didn't believe had any psychic powers that's ridiculous in some ways absurdist in some ways but kind of poetic in the way that wings of desire is a poetic idea or or you know the exorcist you know the idea of the devil wanting the soul of a child is a kind of poetic idea really and mm. and by having a poetic convention you can explore things in in different ways so the mm. wonderful thing about Don't Look Now is that he goes in that poetic realm, but he doesn't make it um, look metaphysical. Yes. Does that make sense? He doesn't make it look yes. extraordinary. He mm. makes it very down to earth. You know, you can almost, when the little little boats are crossing the lagoon, you can almost smell the petrol, you know, <laughs> and that kind of thing. It's very kind of down to, down to earth in that respect, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I... Th I've got a feeling that is the combination that really grabs people over the years. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the fact that the characters feel so real and, and uh, you know, that you feel as if you're just kind of um, overhearing them rather than, <laughs> rather than seeing actors, even though they're very, perfectly well-known actors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. But, but, but it's interesting that in this case, I mean, it, it's down to earth and one could even argue that it's down to water because water plays such an important yeah, role. Yeah. Uh, and um, the, the, the fact that they are studying this um, notion of grief and trauma uh, leads the character, the characters to the town of Venice, which is uh, an in-between place, mm -hmm. uh, both earth and water, uh, very liminal. Uh, you, you can't really define it as one or the other. It, uh, you really have the feeling that it materializes what's happening to them, that they are lost uh, in a maze um, and they keep wandering inside the street. And also, I think the fact it's off-season as well. It's yes. not, so it's not, it's not a place that's uh, kind of like seething with uh, life and, and holiday makers and you know, it's kind of like asleep in a way, yeah. um, uh, and that's that's a brilliant, that's a wonderful stroke, I think. Um, yeah. 
so it's a it's a feeling of a halfway house mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Almost like a kind of purgatory, or, a, or a, yes. but they haven't, and, and maybe that gives the idea that they haven't uh, recovered from this. That yes. it's not something they they haven't broken through into the light yet. Um, yeah. They're um, often dead. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was sorry to, to interrupt. But I was thinking of the Bardo. You know, this place that yes. is in between. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's interesting that you mentioned the awakening because I did think of the awakening um, when we recently rewatched Don't Look Now. And it's interesting the parallels between the presence of children, the idea of processing grief, the trauma that remains, and the way that one might choose or not choose to remember. And then the presence of the lake on the, the property of the manor. Um, yeah, I think, I think there's so many, um, you know, some of those things are deliberate and some of them. Uh, are just, I think, um, a kind of symbolism that, you know, this, I think there's a kind of globally understood symbolism about water and spirituality, really, um, uh, as you, as you were saying about Venice, so there's, there's, it's a kind of liminal, liminal space, or, or a kind of, uh, you know, a, a transition between the real and the unreal, uh, to, to do with water, I think, really. I, I'm kind of interested also in the idea of, of the uncanny experience. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> I notice when I'm working on stories myself that um, it's kind of very important to have a sense of doubt in stories, uh, supernatural stories. I think if you, if you have a story about a ghost and nobody really doubts that the ghost exists, then you have it. Weirdly, it's not a ghost story so much as a fantasy. Mm. So something like Blythe Spirit or... Uh, uh, or, or something like that, where nobody nobody questions why the hell are we seeing ghosts? It, a ghost story, as we understand a ghost story, it has to have someone saying, "No, that that hasn't happened. I haven't seen that." Mm. You're re rejecting every possibility that it's actually in the world because you have to then question your ability to see it. And now you're going mad. And is, is it me or is it something I've seen? Uh, and I think I think that idea that uh, John is kind of constantly unsure what he's seen you know everything's out of the corner of his eye or might be imaginary and that kind of thing um is always very powerful i i meant to say by the way that when i was watching it one of the reasons that i thought that they put the wrong reel on the on the projector was that and i don't know whether anyone else thought this but i was absolutely convinced that he was the murderer they were looking for mm -hmm. uh, uh and that would be that. That would be the twist in the end that he's mm, murdered, mm, um, mm. and it was the ghost of the child, of, the, ch yeah. of the, the child. But I didn't see how it was going to resolve. But um, <laughs> but so many so many wrong turns and so many kind of twists. But the but the small touches were are so marvelous in the casting, aren't they? The 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 police detective and mm. and, the, and the two old ladies, mm. uh, really fantastic. But um, yes, they, they keep you guessing until the very end about whether or not he's the murderer himself. And actually, the last scene when he follows the uh, what um, turns out to be the dwarf. I mean, he acts almost like the big bad wolf following the little red. Uh, um, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 of course, of course, yeah. <laughs> and of course, we know nothing. We don't know anything about uh, the dwarf or the backstory about why the, why the dwarf is murdering. That's why. Can you imagine what would happen if an American studio was remaking that? The, the <laughs> notes you would get about, oh, we've got to explain what the, you know. I almost felt at one stage a couple of years ago, I was going to write a, a short story about the, the dwarf story. Uh -huh. <laughs> just, just as a piece of sarcasm about you know, the backstory of the of the dwarf and what led the dwarf to be a murderer of women. Just had young youth. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And and there's a little moment as well that's just come back to me where where you first see that character at the end and she is it I think is it a female character female dwarf I don't I don't really know but she kind of goes like that like no it's mm -hmm. like you've got it wrong you've got it all wrong yeah. yeah kind of like is that intentional or not I don't know I think mm -hmm. it's probably like a, a movement to make sure that the camera's caught the face I don't know mm -hmm. but it's almost like no. Hmm. I think yeah. he, he tells Yasa to wait, and she says no at this moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. The, I mean, yeah, the, the film is. And then, of course, the, the the wonderful thing that I don't think, I don't think can be in the story, um, 
which is the the funeral barge at the end that's so uh, moving. I, I I think if it ends with John thinking, mm. what a stupid way to die, then they can't can't possibly mm. have the funeral barge, can it? But it's actually so kind of like again, it's that's beautiful because it's um it's both chilling and moving at the same time. It's kind of mm. like she's kind of she's with the two old ladies and she's kind of like comforted by them mm -hmm. and she is almost at peace now that's all happened mm -hmm. uh and weirdly just it doesn't disturb us too much that she's mm -hmm. at peace by that i don't know but like i said there's so much to watch all the time in it you know to um to contemplate you know the connections between things yeah, and, and right after the funeral barge, actually, they uh, land close to a cathedral uh, where it's going to, to be buried or where there's going to be a service. And I was struck by, um, I mean, th there's so much about the film that is about reflection, of course, about uh, yeah. mirror images. But uh, I was struck by the um, symmetrical uh, yeah. construction of the script itself by the fact that it starts in their house with um, um, John and Laura at the top in the house and two children outside. And it ends in the cathedral, um, where this time it's uh, Laura and her boy who are going inside the house, where, uh, whereas uh, John and um, Christine are both dead outside. Uh, this is what I really oh, was struck by yeah. this uh, symmetry there. I, I, I noticed when I was um, just uh, uh, looking online this morning that, um, of course, the story itself starts with John in the restaurant saying to her, don't look now, but those two old ladies are looking at us or something. Mm -hmm. I, you couldn't, you'd never do that in a film because you wouldn't, it would be terrible to say the name of the film in dialogue, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you certainly wouldn't use it as the first line. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet I think this must be 20, 25 minute sequence before that of the death of the child. Mm -hmm. uh, which is such a, a masterful piece of, of cinema. But in the in the story, Christine dies of meningitis. Mm -hmm. um, so it's quite a kind of banal death mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and of course that that the cinematography in that in that opening sequence is so amazing. Uh, that's you know endlessly rewarding to to watch that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the book that's written, the book, the BFI guide to Don't Look Now, I think it dedicates a whole chapter to a list of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the shots that went into that, just that sequence, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's it's absolutely fascinating to look at that. Mm -hmm. And apparently there was a line, um, I'm sure you know this, where in the script where um, uh, I think um, Julie Christie is, is saying... Um, about the curvature of the earth yes. and she has to explain to the child about the curvature of the earth mm. and uh donald sutherland says uh nothing is what it seems mm. and he didn't want to say that line because he says now that tells every that's that's the whole point of the film and i don't want to say it i don't mm. want to say it because it's, it's kind of forecasts what the film is about mm. and mm. the only way he could actually say it is to really throw it away kind of mumble it and throw it away <laughs> so it's, i always find that quite interesting to uh, to see him throw away that line that he's probably right but I th did you hear the story about when nicholas rogue uh, telephoned him to uh, offer him the part do you hear that story no. um no. Uh, mm -hmm. apparently donald sutherland was um didn't know whether he was keen to do it you know i mean he's got nothing but praise for nick, nick rogue now and obviously mm -hmm. named his uh, his son after Nick Rogue and um, uh, you know and loves the film but at the time you know he kind of tells the story against himself in a way by saying I was humming and hawing and this kind of thing and apparently he said uh, oh you know it's about kind of psychic abilities he said but it's all so negative and and kind of bleak could we have something in the script that shows that uh, psychic abilities can be a positive force in the world and Nick Rogue must have been getting very impatient because he apparently he said, "Look, do you want to do this film or not?" <laughs> <laughs> Donald Sutherland said, "Yeah, okay, I'll do it." <laughs> <laughs> so it must have been it must have set off a good relationship. I think that uh, that that, that uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And what do you think about this presence of children? Um, I'm reminded of the fact that in our earliest exchanges, you had mentioned a special appreciation for the turn of the screw and filmic adaptations. Um, 
uh, of the written work. And I'm just wondering what you think about this use of children in the Gothic and the sense of uncanny and at the same time, the immediate sense of grief that one might seize upon and understand. I think, I think that just on a, on a mechanical level, I think the death of, death of a child is so potent because it's, uh, uh, I mean, ghosts in a way go against nature, don't they? they? That's what we wrestle with if we have that experience. But also death of a child goes against nature because the parents should die first, you know? Um, I remember uh, uh, in my childhood, my uh, grandmother, um, her son predeceased her at the age of 50. She was in her 70s or 80s. And I remember her thinking, that's not right. It's not right my son should die before me. And then you have the additional thing of, of it being a, a, you know, a young child. Um, you know, I think it's kind of your, your worst nightmare, really. And also the, the tension that that would put on a, on a couple. Um, so it's, a, it's you know, in, in many ways, it's such a staple of horror that in a way it's a cheap trick <laughs> to have a child uh, sacrificed in a sense. Uh, but children can be used other ways in horror in that the child is kind of what's at stake or the child could be the one that's at risk. Uh, as in The Exorcist or, or whatever, or many, 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 many horror films, you know. But, oh, in uh, fiction. Yeah, yeah. You use a lot of uh, children in your fiction, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I think there's the feeling that children are um, to be protected. It's our job to protect children. So, you know, another, uh, even even a, a um, your, your um, partner of the same age, however, how much you dramatize that um, uh, affection if you like uh, you're not responsible for them the idea of being responsible for someone there's 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 an implicit edge of kind of blame that you weren't there or you did something wrong um, because it's not right <laughs> there's a not rightness about it I think which uh, kind of uh, maybe that's a kind of infection at the beginning of this film as well that um, you, you know just makes it so compelling I think yeah. And it seems to mirror really well the use of nonlinear editing, the fact that somehow the children should be the future and that should go straight through and it's disrupted yeah. right from the beginning. So it skews things immediately and that's reflected visually throughout the film Absolutely, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so powerful that in terms of, um, um, I think it, for me, it was the first film where, where I, I I honestly did think at the time it was such a different way of filmmaking um, that I felt that the perception of the world as it was done with the editing was kind of so much more like it felt to be in the world than mm -hmm. conventional filmmaking, mm -hmm. if, if, if that makes sense. Just mm -hmm. the idea that we're, we're, we're given, here's the thing, we're given fragments all the time that we don't know the meaning of. We're given we're given shots of, we see someone across the road, we don't know, is that person a bad person, a good person? Mm -hmm. Is that, <laughs> and we get, we get tiny fragments of behavior that we have to interpret all the time, dozens of them, hundreds of things per day that we see out the corner of our eye, objects we see, what's the story of that object? What's the significance of that happening? Mm -hmm. um, so kind of like applying that, distilling that into a work of cinema, which is all about, chosen objects chosen images you know why the rain against the uh, the rain against the blinds at the beginning mm -hmm. um why is that significant i don't know i mean apart from setting up the the, the water but it's a, but it's maybe just a thing that's in your mind it's just a thing that is an an image if you think about certain times um in your past um isolated images become very powerful and i think that's what he's so good at singularly good at, at picking out these things and, and also what he does uh, this is not presumption on my part in a way but i mean i think a little bit like david lynch in this respect he trusts his instinct to go for what he finds visually interesting hmm. he doesn't think oh is the studio going to like this shot should i cover it with you know a wide shot doing this no i'm going to film it like this because that's thinking from the inside of the scene out and what I what I want emotionally in this scene, you know, and I think David Lynch also knocking back his black coffee and cigarettes. If something bubbles up from the subconscious, then he 
he trusts it. He trusts the unconscious to tell him what to do. And I think to an extent, uh, I think Rogue does that as well. Mm-hmm. Kind of on, not autopilot, I wouldn't say autopilot. I would say in a way hypersensitive, but mm-hmm. hypersensitive in, instinctively mm-hmm. to, to surroundings, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the, our very thought process is not linear, is it? I mean, uh, at least mine is not. <laughs> I always go back and forth between uh, ideas and images and have little fragments that um, somehow I'm trying to put together a bit like the character of John um, in the story. Because, yes. Uh, as a... Um, uh, a detective, but also as an art historian, because he's working on a mosaic uh, in the church. Yes. And I think that it's Perfect, it? yeah. the, the pieces of the puzzle together. And he, the only moment when he um, ends up doing that is just before his death, when uh, he sees all those pieces uh, put back in a linear fashion. So that's the moment when the mosaic starts to make sense. But um, unfortunately, that's the end, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And there's the little cutaway to the um, the brooch, the jewellery that the bishop is wearing. Mm. Um, somehow that gets a little closer, as if it's significant. Uh, why is that significant? I mean, that, those are the kind of questions that come up. Why is that cutaway significant? Why is it there? Mm. Like in a, in a Hollywood film, you'd have to justify that. That's a plot point or that's a... That's making a point, but maybe it isn't making a point. Maybe it's just saying, "Is this a point?" <laughs> I think, and it's, it's a playfulness about that. I mean, I don't mean playfulness in in the kind of um, uh, kind of like trivial sense. Mm. Uh, playfulness in in the kind of deepest artistic sense. I think really, which mm. which which is everything about the scene is might be significant. So. Um, so it's a very 360 kind of like uh, appreciation of what's going on in a dramatic scene and any little thing can be can be picked up and can be meaningful, which comes from the subject matter, you know, which is about what is meaningful in this story of this man, what is he missing uh, mm. and what is what could he observe if he just had the, uh, if he wasn't so blinded to his own kind of internal state in a way, you know, mm. um, so, so the approach does I think that's why it stands out even amongst Nick Rogue films is because the subject matter at its core mm. really suits the technique that he puts into making it really. Like I, I love all his films. It's mm. interesting that Alan Scott as well, one of the writers has, has done five films with him, I noticed, um, mm. which, which surprised me that he'd, he'd written as, as many as, uh, as that. So they must, they must have uh, clicked over this, I should think. Mm. Mm. I'm such a huge fan of Nicholas Rogue in general, but in this film, one of the things that I find that may be unique compared to some of the others is the kind of physicality, the somatic sensations that we feel in this film. And I'm wondering what you think about that in the sense that right away we witness the death and we see the very physical response of the father as he moves into the water. We hear the scream of the mother. But later, we also have a very famous sex scene that's really beautifully choreographed through montage editing. So there are a lot of very sensorial aspects to this film that I think really are transmitted to the viewer in a very direct yeah, way. Absolutely. I mean, it is very sensitive in both senses, isn't it? Um, I, I mean, I think uh, um, the kind of, in a way, explicitness of the sex scene didn't shock me when I saw it in the 1970s, because there was quite a lot of it about <laughs> in films at that time. I mean, people since have been kind of more shocked about it. Um, what I thought was marvellous about it is the intercutting with them getting dressed afterwards. And that was such a, um, that was the revelation for me, is is that the ordinariness of, okay, mm. this, this couple is making love, but also they're getting ready to go out for dinner, you know, and... Mm. It's also taking a shit and said and says I wouldn't go in there for a few minutes if I were you. You know those are the humanizing aspects that make you kind of really feel for the characters. You know, mm-hmm. and none of them they don't sit down and say, oh, you know what, I'm still a bit upset about my child dying. <laughs> they just don't say any of that mm-hmm. because you've been told all that. You know, um, and uh, and then of course there's the fateful meeting in the in 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 the restaurant. Which is, mm. uh, which is fantastic, but the, but the yeah the tonal and the um, it's almost like um, yeah I don't know what that comes 
does it come from the also the um color the 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 color palette to a certain extent i mean obviously the the red is really mm. important but um but there is a kind of somber palette apart from that isn't there mm. Mm. very wintry gray and, mm. Mm. and, the, and there's also um there's no um it doesn't look lavish yes uh, like a um uh, you know a, thank god it was made for the budget it was made for because you wouldn't want it to be in a way made uh more colorfully or more mm, mm. slickly you know i always think slick is the enemy you know especially when you see a film like this and and it mm. annoys the heck out of me when you see genre films now that are kind of praised to high heaven and they're so slick but they have quite frankly, no kind of emotional impact on me because they seem concocted. They seem so obviously concocted. Um, and I'm not saying everything has to be naturalistic. Um, mm. And there's some, you know, I'm certainly not being curmudgeonly because there's some wonderful films made at, at the moment. But the idea of the idea of using um, naturalism and almost... Um, I wouldn't say documentary naturalism because I don't think it's that, but a, but a kind of naturalistic approach to something that's unnatural. I mm, think that's, mm. the, that's the key. So the so you make the characters as natural as possible, you make the cinematography as natural as possible, and you kind of you're kind of wooing the audience into a world that that if you're not careful, they won't accept. Mm, mm. <laughs> that's the game, really, and that's the game that I've you know been fascinated by for thirty odd years. Um, you know to try and you know, for the span that someone's watching something or reading something, they think, oh, this, you know, this could, this could have happened. I mean, that, to me, there's no point in, in doing it in, in another sense. You've got to feel for the characters and feel that, feel that I guess, yeah, they're, they're about kind of human dilemmas, but um, amplified into mm. some kind of poetic sense, mm. Mm. <laughs> sensibility anyway, rather than sense. Mm. But, 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 yeah, I, I think that the bleak colors have a, a strong impact on us viewers um, and that they, at least on a uh, subconscious level, they inform us about the fact that even though there is this beautiful sex scene, um, it's not going to change um, the path that the film uh, is following. Mm -hmm. I had the feeling that um, the two of them are very much like Adam and Eve. You know, they are all nude during the whole sequence that they are trying to recreate a certain Garden of Eden, but it is doomed to fail because the colors are not quite there, are they? Also, I was thinking what you said about being in this kind of liminal space, this um, uh, purgatory, if you like, or halfway house. It's kind of um, emphasized by the fact that they're, uh, he's American, she's English, and they're in a different country is is yes. an obvious point yes. to make. So that everyone around them hmm. is dislocated from them. I yes. mean, even though they feel they don't feel as if they're um, out of sync with anyone. I mean, I think they speak a bit of Italian, don't they, at, at times and that kind of thing. Hmm. Um, but there's still the sense of you know what they, in a cliche way, call, call fish out of water kind of hmm. kind of thing hmm. that may, it gives additional kind of tension. I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. No, they definitely had to leave home and there is no home to go back to, except I would argue for uh, the last home, which is the cathedral at the end. There's one curious thing that just occurred to me. I wonder why they, just thinking in terms of the mechanics of the story, why they kept uh, the, the little boy. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, because I could see if I was writing this, some producer would say, well, you know, they've lost a child, won't why don't they lose their only child? That would be much more, mm. potent, you know. Um, and yet they don't in the story, and it, and it, and there's, it works perfectly well with the with the child being at uh, boarding school and all the rest of it mm. um, as a, as a subplot. I quite I quite like that. Really. Um, but but it's interesting that 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 wasn't you know taken out. Could, could I risk a sorry oh, no. <laughs> a personal theory about this? Um, um, I've noticed that the little boy, um, first of all, uh, has the same name as his father. is Johnny and the father is John. Uh, and as the film progresses, he takes on the attributes of the little girl and of the father. By the end of the film, he's wearing a cap that is the same red as uh, the coat that the girl is wearing at the beginning. But he's also wearing um, 
a code that is a very reminiscent of his father's code. So my personal understanding of his role is that he's going to replace both the father and the little girl. So he's become the man of, man of the house, but also, mm. yeah. but also maybe at the end would be just too brutal for her to have no child. Yes. Mm. So uh, you know, in that, maybe that's the mechanics uh, mechanical mm. reason is that at least we can give her a child at the end, even if she's lost the other child. Um, <laughs> Within the plot, I think it's also really important the moment when she gets called back to England to his school, because that's, of course, when John thinks he sees her on the canal and doesn't realize that it's the vision of his own funerary. Yeah, um, yeah, of course, mm. yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. It's very, very expertly done. And in a way, very close to the story. Um, and yet completely cinematic, mm. which, is, mm. which is another reason I love it, really. I mean, people... People say that a story can't possibly work as a film if it works as a uh, on the page, but it just shows that, that, that both things can, uh, you know, can work in different media. Mm -hmm. And prior to the film, were you a fan of Daphne du Maurier's writing? Um, you know what? I don't know whether I I was a kind of aficionado of um, um, I guess horror stories and books of horror stories. Whether I I don't think I'd read it before. I don't think I'd read anything of hers actually, but um, no, I don't think I had. No, no, mm. but but I knew her reputation because of the birds and mm. that. Yes, yeah. Could we ask you what you're cur currently working on? Um, well, <laughs> if there's anything you can uh, share, I can't tell you too much about it. But rather interestingly, it is about. In fact, the scene I was just writing was about. Uh, was about someone that's a scientist talking to, in a church to someone that was a, a religious person um, asking each other what they believe in. And uh, <laughs> quite, I re I'll tell you what this little bit was, actually, because it's quite funny. Uh, he, sa he says to her, um, I often wonder if God is real, would he, con would he condemn us for questioning his existence? And she says, um, what do you believe in? And he says, science and then she says be careful what you sacrifice in that belief so i'm basically going through the usual stuff that <laughs> don't mm. look now has set me on the path of exploring <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's a 1920s a kind of a ghost story but uh, i'm uh, just beginning to get to uh, get uh, embedded into it so uh, i hope uh, there's, there's you know i can't say when it'll happen or if it'll happen but uh, i'm hoping uh, it will Thank you so much for your time today. And thank you so much for sharing your love for this film with us. Really enjoyed it. It's been good fun. I hope you enjoyed it too. We did. We absolutely. Did. Yes. And we really appreciate your own writing, both fiction and for the screen. So thank you for that. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening to After Images. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast app and follow After Images podcast on social media.